Modern businesses are buying more and more SaaS every year. At the Scale Factory, we use somewhere in the region of 30 SaaS products to run our business. And in conversation with other business owners, I've learned that that's a fairly usual number. Gartner calculated that the global enterprise software spend in 2020 was around $529 billion. In 2023, that will have increased to $750 billion, and a huge amount of that will be spent on SaaS. Software really is eating the world, and those of us building software products have a great deal of power. But as Spider-Man fans have known for a long time, with great power comes great responsibility. As SaaS builders, our customers place a great deal of trust in us, their businesses rely on the services we provide being available, and they hand over their data to us, expecting that we'll take good care of it on their behalf. Will we? We've reviewed over 400 AWS platforms using the AWS Well-Architected Framework, and we've learned that many teams aren't thinking adequately about their backups and their disaster recovery plans. It's fairly likely that this applies to you and your team too, and maybe that's why you're watching today. In the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to help you understand what your responsibilities are when it comes to your platform's resilience and the three types of disaster that you should be planning for. We'll take a look at what AWS provides you to help with this, and we'll consider the trade-offs between resilience and cost. And stay tuned to hear about three SaaS companies who got themselves into trouble by not addressing this stuff adequately. It's easy to assume that by building our applications in the cloud, they'll automatically be resilient. But resilience is a shared responsibility between AWS and SaaS builders. AWS works hard towards resiliency of the cloud, and we have our own responsibilities towards resiliency in the cloud. And it's important that we devote time and energy to those. Human beings are biased towards optimism. Here's psychologist Daniel Kahneman on the topic. For an entrepreneur, it may be a good thing to be an optimist because it will make him or her uh, persevere more. We know that being an optimist is useful under some conditions. It is not always useful in making decisions. We mistakenly believe that our chances of experiencing negative events are lower than those of our peers and that our chances of experiencing positive events are higher. Amazon CTO Werner Vogels has a much more realistic take on things. As I always like to say, everything fails all the time. Uh, there's all these things that will happen to you at scale that you need to be able to be prepared for. It's time for you to use your great responsibility and be the hero here. You must ignore that natural overconfidence that everything will go well. Kahneman recommends taking a pre-mortem approach. Imagine yourself in the future with your platform having failed and then write down what went wrong and why. Use that then to prioritize and mitigate potential failure modes one by one. What the pre-mortem technique does, which I think is beautiful, is it legitimizes dissent. Actually turn things around. It rewards people for being imaginative in finding flaws in the current plan. By forcing ourselves to consider negative outcomes, we can resist the short-sightedness of overconfidence. Only then can we be prepared when disaster strikes. The word disaster comes from the Italian disastro, meaning ill-starred event, which implies a kind of calamity to be blamed on some unfavorable position of the stars. Now, I'm a Capricorn, so I don't put any stock in astrology. I think we can probably avoid worrying too much about celestial mechanics. But what are the things that should concern us? There are three main categories of disaster we might want to think about. Hollywood's highest grossing disaster movies, if we ignore the films about large ships, alien invasion and zombie outbreaks, are mostly concerned with natural disasters. In the real world, there are some natural disasters that we should take seriously, naming earthquakes and flooding. Vodafone saw the impact of this late in 2014, 2015 rather. After a lot of heavy rain, the River Air in Leeds, literally metres from where I am now, burst its banks and flooded one of their data centres, disrupting service for its users for around 24 hours. This footage shows Kirkstall Road, where that facility is located, severely underwater. I've been working in the tech industry for over 20 years now, and I remember, though not especially fondly, building internet servers from home PC parts and having to drive to our data centre in the middle of the night to replace failed components. Thankfully, today's cloud platforms are way more reliable than that, but technical failures such as faults with power and networking can still happen, and even a vendor as reliable as AWS can have these sorts of faults, though thankfully when things go pop at 3am, those are someone else's problem now. Back in December 2021, AWS saw networking problems and issues starting new instances after they had a power failure in one of its US East 1 data centers in Virginia, which took a few hours to resolve. Now, truth be told, the most likely cause of failure on your platform is human action. This encompasses people inside your organization accidentally misconfiguring things or deleting the wrong data, as well as bad guys attacking your systems from the outside. 
Some of these can be mitigated against using careful access control and other security measures, but inevitably someone with great power is going to greatly screw something up one day. Just like what happened to two of the companies I'm going to tell you about later. Now that we understand the types of disaster that we need to contend with, as with all good solutions architecture, we need to consider our business requirements. A good understanding of the requirements allows us to choose an appropriate design. If we don't know what we need, we might implement something that doesn't work or deliver a solution that costs too much or that comes with too much additional complexity. There are two concepts we should bear in mind here. It's the recovery time objective, or the RTO, which is the maximum amount of time that's acceptable for a service to be unavailable in the event of interruption. The clock starts ticking here as soon as the service becomes unavailable or degraded and stops once everything is back up and running. Business critical services will necessarily have a short RTO. Less user facing stuff like business intelligence batch jobs might be more lenient than that. Second, the recovery point objective. The RPO is the maximum amount of acceptable data loss in the event of an outage. If we have a search index that's constructed entirely from data in a main database, for example, it might be okay if we lose all of that data, but for a service that creates results from other websites every night, an RPO of 24 hours might be fine. A service of transferring urgent clinical data between hospital departments should probably never lose a single byte. Now, these terms relate closely to something else that you'll definitely have heard of, a service level agreement. An SLA will form part of the contract between you and your customers. Typically, these concern a service level indicator, which is something that we're measuring, for example, percentage uptime or acceptable error rate, and a service level objective, which is what number or range we want that indicator to be at. If the objective is breached during that contracted period, which is typically a month, then the agreement will define how the customer is going to be compensated, perhaps issuing for refunds or service credits. AWS lists SLAs and their penalties for all of their services. If an RDS database is available for less than 95% of the month, AWS will refund you 100% of that monthly cost. We found that it's not unusual for younger businesses to construct their SLAs without thinking about whether the platform can deliver on the objective they set. In fact, sometimes SLAs are blindly copied from other providers' contracts, which obviously isn't a great idea. When was the last time you reviewed your SLAs? Can you meet those SLAs with your current infrastructure? Much of what we've already spoken about today applies to all platforms built on top of AWS. But if you're building SaaS products, there's an extra dimension to consider, and that's tenancy. Depending on how you've built your products, you may have some resources that are shared between all of your tenants and some that are unique to an individual tenant. In the event of a disaster that affects multiple tenants, how will you prioritize recovery? You might have different service level agreements with different tenants. Some might operate in different time zones and be asleep during a period of disaster. Some might be paying you orders of magnitude more than others. If you run a freemium model, some might not be paying you anything at all. Should you prioritize actions that aid the recovery of your highest paying client, or actions that recover the highest number of tenants, even if most of those are on your lowest pricing tier? It's important to make these sorts of decisions now, while you have the time and headspace to think about them, not when you're already being licked by the flames of a burning disaster. This is fine. I'm okay with the events that are unfolding currently. That's okay. Things are gonna be okay. AWS provides an extensive global infrastructure for your applications. Today there are 26 regions worldwide. These are separate locations where AWS services can be run. In every region there are multiple availability zones, and you can think of these like individual data centers, each with their own power, cooling, and physical security. Any failure in one of these AZs by design won't affect another. The AZs of a region are up to 100 kilometers apart, which is a meaningful distance when it comes to thinking about the impact of natural disasters, but close enough to dig together that data can replicate between them in real time. Many AWS services can be configured to run across multiple availability zones trivially, and by spreading our workload across multiple AZs, we can avoid many types of potential failure. The AWS power failure I mentioned earlier was restricted to a single availability zone in Virginia, so customers who'd made appropriate multi-AZ design choices with their platform were unaffected by it. Your RPO and RTO, once you've figured those out, will drive your architectural decisions. If it's acceptable to have your platform unavailable for a few hours and to lose an hour or more of data, then a simple backup and restore approach may be all that you need. You'll probably run your platform in a single region, cross multiple availability zones, but you won't need to worry about being able to fail over to a second region. This is the simplest and least expensive architecture. It doesn't mitigate against the failure of a whole region, but those are very rare. And if that asteroid strike hits hard enough to take out multiple availability zones that are 100 kilometers apart from each other, then you might very well have more pressing concerns. 
If it's critical that your platform remain as available as possible at all times and lose almost no data in the event of a disaster, then you'll likely have to invest in a highly available active-active multi-region solution where your application runs in two regions simultaneously with data replicated between them. Now, this is the most expensive and complex option, and you'll probably have to make changes to your application code to support it too. In between those two ends of the scale, there are other options. For example, in a pilot-like deployment, you might replicate data periodically into a second region and then use infrastructure as code automation to provision fresh application servers when a failover is needed. This, of course, means a period of time when services can't be reached while the automation runs, but it costs less than the fully multi-region deployment. Regardless of the design they choose, successful SaaS companies adopt two best practices here. Platform automation, using CloudFormation or Terraform or something to define the infrastructure as code, and automated backups. When it comes to thinking about backing up data, first of all, you should consider what data assets you have in your platform. You probably have at least a database or two, but you should probably also consider things like object stores, file systems, caches, and search indexes. Each of these data assets will have its own backup and retention requirements, either for operational region, reasons or for regulatory purposes. For example, you might want to keep just 30 days of nightly database backups, but your audit logs may need to be retained for seven years in order to meet a compliance obligation. If your cache or your search index can be rebuilt entirely from your primary data store, it might not need backing up at all. Do you know right now what data assets you have and how they should be backed up? If not, that's something you should probably go away and think about once this session wraps up. Once you understand your backup requirements, you'll need to configure those backups to run on the required schedule. You'll find that a tool called AWS Backup will help enormously with that, scheduling backups across supported services in multiple regions. Our recommendation is that you should be using multiple AWS accounts for a variety of good operational region reasons, and AWS Backup integrates with AWS Control Tower to manage your backup job across all of these accounts, making it easy to show your auditor that your platform is fully in compliance with local policy. You might also find that your compliance regime requires you to keep a copy of your backups in a separate AWS account altogether, or possibly even entirely outside of AWS. AWS Backup will report on backup failures so that your team can take action if something goes wrong. At least one of the teams we'll hear about later would have benefited from this feature. Some of their backups have been failing for a while, and they only discovered this when it was too late. As usual, there are some gotchas to look out for. If only a small privileged group of people on your team can access the resources where you store your sensitive data, then you need to make sure that your access control also extends to your backups. You should protect your backups with the same level of care as the data itself, regardless of where those copies end up. It's also important to make sure that your security policies prevent accidental deletion of backups so that they're always there when you need them. If the only thing that can remove your backup data is the automation process that manages retention, that's probably the best choice. If your disaster recovery strategy for a failure of region A relies on being able to restore to a backup into region B, then you need to make sure that your backup process includes the operation which copies the data into region B ready for use. Otherwise, you'll find that when disaster strikes, you can't get at the original region, you can't get at your backup either. In fact, you should never be waiting until an actual disaster to find out whether your recovery processes work. But the majority of teams we've reviewed haven't recently tried to restore from a backup if they've ever done that at all. It's ludicrous and yet another example of our optimism bias to expect that if you've never tried a potentially complex operation like failing over to a second region or restoring a production backup, that you'll know what to do and that you'll get it right first time under the pressure of a production outage. I love learning about the Apollo space program. One of the things that really stands out to me about those missions is the extent to which the astronauts repeatedly practiced absolutely everything about the moon mission for years before they launched it for real. Just like NASA, High-performing SAS teams document and regularly rehearse their disaster recovery plans for a range of failure scenarios, timing their attempts to ensure that they can meet their SLA obligations. Now, I will tell you about those three SAS companies who had high-profile failures, and at least one of these would have benefited from more of this sort of rehearsal. But first, let's, let's recap. Today, we've learned that humans are bad at planning for disasters because we're too optimistic. We've learned that we shoulder some of the responsibility for coping with disasters through architecture and operational planning, and that there are three types of disasters that we need to consider. Natural disasters, technical failures, and human action. We've learned that there are a number of approaches to disaster recovery, ranging from the simple and inexpensive to the complex and costly, and that we must choose the approach that best fits the different business needs for each of our SaaS tenants. We've learned that it's important to understand what data we hold, how to back it up, 
how frequently and for how long those backups must be kept. We've learned that there are AWS services available to help manage these processes. And we've learned that there are some gotchas involved in recovering from disasters and that these are best avoided by periodically rehearsing failure conditions. Now, as promised, let's look at some examples of failure to get this stuff right. Businesses that don't plan for disaster recovery of their cloud estate can end up in trouble. This is so much more true for SaaS companies than any other. For SaaS businesses, your platform is your business. Last month, 400 Atlassian customers went without access to any of their services for two weeks after a botched data op operation accidentally deleted their data. Whilst they had backups of customer data, they didn't have the ability to restore individual tenants and it took them the whole fortnight to recover from this failure. How many of these customers do you think spent that time investigating what it would take to migrate away to another provider instead? Don't you think that could have been avoided if they'd had a plan for this sort of scenario? GitLab had a similar failure back in 2017 when they accidentally deleted a production database and then spent the next few horrifying hours realizing that some of the backup processes they thought were in place weren't. Not only was the platform down for many hours, they also lost about six hours of customer data updates. Now Atlassian and GitHub were lucky in that they were able to recover sufficiently to continue trading, albeit with some loss of reputation. But not all disasters have a happy ending. Disaster recovery without the recovery is just a disaster. In 2014, a SaaS company called Codespaces, who provided Git and Subversion repositories as a service, was put out of business after they were unable to recover from a security incident. They eventually admitted defeat, putting out a statement which read, Codespaces will not be able to operate beyond this point. We have no alternative but to cease trading and concentrate on supporting our affected customers in exporting any remaining data they have left with us. Now imagine how it would feel to be the CTO or CEO who has to write an update like that. Well, hopefully today, you'll take away some thoughts about how you can avoid being the next SaaS failure story. And we can help you with that. I'd like to recommend that you book a free backup and DR health check with one of my team. We'll take just 45 minutes on a call with you to talk about your current approach. At the end of that 45 minutes, we'll let you know where we think that your gaps are and how we can help you close them. That might include a deployment of AWS Control Tower along with AWS Backup. Because we understand both of these services inside and out, we can deliver these for you at a fixed price. We can also work with your team over a 12-month period to establish and rehearse your disaster recovery plans as part of our SaaS growth subscription. This also includes access to our team for support and, and some regular training for you to skill up your own people. You can book your free health check by visiting our website at scalefactory.com. Use the free health check button at the top of the page and then click book now. You can find a time to suit you and if you have priorities other than just backups and DR, we can take a look at those with you too.